All right, the book of Romans. Hasn't it been fun? Yeah. Amen. Are you getting really good at remembering what all the chapters are about? <laughs> sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. Listen, I, I sometimes I'll wrestle with a little bit, you know, but it's, it's really good. So the book has really been rich. So tonight it is chapter 15. Amen. Romans 15. All right, so do you remember what chapter 1 was about? Off the top of your head. What? Ah, that's right. What happens when a human being rejects God? God is for everybody. We're made to run on God, if I could use that way. So a car is made to run on certain fuels. Can you say amen? So basically, when we don't run on God, Romans 1 tells us what can happen to a human and how debased or how corrupted they can become with the evil one in this planet. Amen? Do you remember what chapter 7 was about? It was about how the Jews are married to the law, and it was really difficult for them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. An alternative, so Paul teaches, that, you know, you're married to your husband as long as your husband lives. You're married to the law as long as, long as the law is what... Um, legal or in operation, but we know that Jesus fulfilled the law, right? So the law is not necessarily in operation. For example, back in the law, they sacrificed animals, didn't they? They're not doing that now, are they? Nope. At least we don't know that they are. Amen. So basically, the law has been fulfilled in Christ. So it was really difficult for them to separate them and walking in the freedom in Christ. And then Paul, the last part of chapter 7, remember, he says it was hard as a Pharisee to try to follow the law and do good because when he wanted to do good, what was present with him? Evil. Amen. Amen. Now, do you remember chapter 14? That was last week. What was it about? What was it about? It was about how that, uh, <laughs> don't stumble somebody over food, right? <laughs> Amen. So we won't go into great detail, but about, you know, it, it basically told us to, in our walk, to be sensitive to others, right? You can't really, as a Christian, say, well, I don't care what other people think. I understand the phrase. But we really can't say that because our testimony is supposed to be important. It's supposed to tell everyone Without words, our life is supposed to tell everyone that we're in love with God and God's influence is alive and well in our life. Can you say amen? Yes. All right, now we're going to go to chapter 15. So go under point there. The Apostle Paul points out now the importance of bearing one another's burdens and to please his neighbor and not themselves. Amen? How important it was to stay unified in one mind, loving one another, and glorifying God. You see, there were both Jews and Gentiles. Now remember, if we can just make it simple, the Jewish nation was handpicked by God through Abraham to bring forth Messiah, right? But what really happened, and I'm trying to be gentle about it, is they all got puffed up because they were chosen, you see. And so by the time Jesus showed up, they rejected him, the real Messiah. And so after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, many Jewish people turned to the Lord. But it was difficult, Romans chapter 7. And it was very difficult. And sometimes you get a chance. That's what the book of Hebrews is about, is relating to a Jew that's so bound by the law, so married to it, it's hard for them to even imagine liberation in Christ. Do you follow what I'm saying? And so we're going to see a little bit of that tonight. So in chapter 15, Paul encourages them that whether you be a Jew or Gentile, both of you are designed to give glory to God, and that's the main thing. Can you say amen? And what does the devil like to do? We like to try to repeat this for Christians, especially some of the new ones that are coming back that haven't ever been taught that. The devil loves to turn people against one another, whether it be male against female, whether it be uh, white against another color, whether it be you belong to this club and you don't. 
You have your favorite baseball team and they don't. You see, your politics, everything. So the Jews were against the Gentiles, Gentiles against the Jews. Bringing that down during Paul's time, there were only two that God considered, the Jewish nation and all of the Gentile nations. Now let me ask you, do you believe it was always God's plan for God to save everybody? Amen, Jew or Gentile. So it doesn't really trouble any of us to hear Paul saying, hey, the main plan of God was to save everybody. And he would do it through the Messiah, which would come out of the Jewish nation. But remember, even the Jewish nation, they had to serve God by faith, not by works. Cain and Abel. Okay, that's for some of you that are taking notes and all. All right, so... Again, so both Jews and Gentiles may receive one another and worship God together. So Paul had to leave and go to Jerusalem and then to Iconium, preach the full gospel all throughout that region. And now he journeys to Jerusalem one more time before he gets the chance to go to Rome because he was given some gifts, some finances to deliver to the small church at Rome, excuse me, at Jerusalem. Now, can you remember who the pastor of the church at Jerusalem was? It, for those on camera, can you remember? It's silent in here. James, James. And so a lot, a lot of times when I, I refer to the book of James, I refer to him to Pastor James because it's one of the only books that he's teaching his congregation and it's written down in the Gospels. Hello, it's written down in the New Testament. James is addressing his congregation at Jerusalem. Now, who was the apostle of Jerusalem? Apostle meaning the main guy under God. Peter, that's right, Denise. Very good. Peter, the apostle, James, what, the pastor. All right, so here Paul is bringing a special gift from the Gentiles to the church, mostly Jews, in Jerusalem, not very large, who believed in God. And then he says, then I'm going to skip up through Spain and head to Rome. Can you say amen? So that's chapter 15. It's going to cover those things. So we got a prelude scripture before we actually go to Romans chapter 15. So if you would just go to Romans 15, put your finger there. I'm going to go to a scripture that deals with maturity and bearing with one another's burdens. Okay? That's the scripture you have it written down in your notes. It's Galatians 6. Run through 6. But you go to Romans 15, and put your finger right there. Just kind of give you a break, because I'm going to two, two places. All right. Now, in Galatians, listen to this. And I'm going to ask you a quick question before we read it. What makes a Christian mature and not mature? Now, think of it this way. We all are growing at different rates. We're all at different levels of growth. But there is a time when you and I move into a maturity that's not our own. We move into God's spirit. We move in the spirit realm. It's called being spiritual. Everyone say being spiritual. Now that's not walking around breathing on your fingernails and doing one of these numbers, I'm spiritual. No, it means that you're under the unction and the flow of God's spirit at the time. It might be to go to a hospital and visit a sick person. It might be to lay hands on somebody. It might be just to share, like with me many times, when I'm sharing the word, I get under the spirit. You know, it doesn't mean I'm inst- I make myself mature. So we're going to read this. So when you see the word, you who are spiritual, means you who are under the Holy Spirit's guidance. Now, that doesn't mean permanently. How many know that the anointing comes on us heavy at certain times, and it seems like we're not even doing the work? Amen? Amen? And then other times, we're doing the work, but the 
we know it's the will of God, but it's not a heavy anointing on it. How many know you can be filled with the Spirit and then there, you can be cloaked with the Spirit? Okay? You're filled, cloaked. So when we are filled and cloaked and under the leading of the Spirit, you move from who you are into who He is, which is mature. Okay, now you'll understand the Scripture. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, having any fault, you who are spiritual. Now, do you understand what spiritual means there? Under the unction of the spirit, not so spiritual, you're going to point out their faults. <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, please don't look at mine. Okay. Brethren, if man caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. So our job when somebody does something wrong is correct them. No, our job, if you're under the spirit of God, if you have the heart of Jesus in it, is to get them restored. Hello? So when you see Christians pointing out other people's faults and not helping to, to bear a burden, then what happens? They're not being mature at all. But a Christian who's really mature, love is their motive, isn't it? The Spirit of God is guiding them. And what is God's heart? Does God want anybody to perish? No, I wish that none would perish. But all would come to the knowledge of the truth, Jesus, Jesus said. Right? So you who are spiritual, restore such a one. But consider your own self, lest you be what? Tempted. Verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens. In other words, responsibilities. Help other people out. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Can you tell me what the law of Christ is? Love is the law of Christ. Okay? Love. Okay? Love your Lord thy God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as I have loved you. New Testament. The Old Testament says love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? Boy, to nowadays, not many people love themselves a whole lot. You know, in fact, I hear a lot of people going, I don't like myself. I says, well, I don't like myself either, but I'm talking about my flesh. I like the guy inside me with God, but I don't like this outside guy that kind of gets out of line once in a while. That's why I hope I'm never around anybody when that happens. <laughs> it's a joke, sorry. Nobody laughed. All right, moving right along. Maybe that's too close to home. I have no idea. Okay, but this says, for anyone thinks himself, this is the key. Now, we haven't even got to Romans. Remember, put your finger there. Verse 3, Galatians 6. Verse 3 says, so for if anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing. Well, that's sobering. He deceives himself. What is the biggest thing that Satan fell from? Pride. Thinking himself something. What's the key to every argument? Pride. Because you have to think you're right. Moving right along. You see how it all works in. The enemy's working in that flesh part and the spirit of God's working in the other part. Amen. It says walk in the spirit, right? You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. But then it goes on and it says, he deceives himself, verse 4. But let each one examine his own work. Everyone say, I must examine what I'm doing. Amen. Otherwise, pastor will get all over my case. No, I don't know. No. How many know that it's important to examine what you're doing? How many know if you're working with a saw, very important to examine what you're doing so you don't saw off a finger? Huh? You're working with people. Think of this. You're working with people, one of the most precious things to God. People. Wonderful, wonderful people. And you have to work in the right spirit. Can you say amen? amen. So we have to examine how we're doing it. You know, if you do not, if, well, I'll put it this way. If you're not very good with children, you shouldn't be in the nursery. Right. Go ahead. Hello? If you can't drive, don't, don't get in the taxi. 
I mean, don't start driving for taxis, you know what I'm saying? All right, so it's just simple understanding. So we need to examine our own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one will bear its own load, bear its own load. What does that mean? Each person will bear their own load. You'll have to be your own judge and be responsible. You'll have to take responsibility. Did you do a good job today? Or, you know, just for example, every day, I treat every day like a job. I'm doing a job on behalf of others, bringing God to them. Okay, now I also see it as a ministry, that I'm ministering, but I'm not ministering, hopefully, myself. I'm ministering what God's packaged in me. How many know when you're born, you get talents, and then God gives you gifts? We have talents. We're to use those talents for God, and God gives us gifts. We're to take those gifts and produce more gifts. Amen. So we're always supposed to be going forward. All right. So you look at this and you go, you which are spiritual, our job is to point out everybody's fault. No. What's the church been doing for the last 10 years all over the United States? Pointing out each other's faults. And you know why the church doesn't have power? Because we're shorting out each other by getting mad and listening to the enemy turning on one another's doctrines and opinions and say, I don't like that way that guy does that. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Listen, if you got somebody that's absolutely right on when it comes with business, comes time with running certain things, but he has a terrible personality, do you throw him out good in business and good in doing his job because you can't stand his personality? You better believe a lot of people do. And see, that's judging with our eyes and our ears when the Bible says we need to not judge at all. But rather to discern if someone's good or what's said is good for us or not. All right, moving right on. Romans, are you ready? 15 verse 1. Bearing one another's burden. Okay, Paul goes on in verse 1 and he says in Romans 15, we then who are strong, Say, that's me. Because we're to be strong in the Lord, right? Amen. So you're strong. Ought to bear the scruples, or if you have an old King James, the infirmities of the weak. Can anybody tell me what scruples are? Do you remember the old English, what a scruple was? Is what their infirmity brought. So if a person has an infirmity, you have to also deal with their couch or wheelchair. Or you also have to deal with their sleeping schedule. And or how much do you help or not help them? So when they use the old term scruples, that's a good, that's a good word. Because it not only means to carry one that's infirm or weak and to take care of them as best you can... I mean, one can't do it for everybody, you don't understand. But also you have to put into play, you know, you have to have room in your car for a wheelchair. You have to consider all that's involved. And that's what that part's really meaning. Not just, oh yeah, be warm, be filled, I'll buy you a hamburger this afternoon, you know, and they need help to the car and somebody to carry their luggage. So the scruple means more than just them. It means what's involved with that weakness. Okay? And you know, any good Christian considerate person always considers that person and should consider before they sit down with something whether or not they can do it. Let's go have lunch. Can you do it? And you know what I mean? All right, so let's get past that. He says, now... You which are strong. So in other words, if you're having big problems yourself, don't volunteer. <laughs> okay. And, and not to please ourselves. So bear the firmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Verse 2, let each of us please his neighbor for his good leading to edification. 
In other words, don't go out and pick a fight with your neighbor. For even Christ did not please himself. Get a chance, read Philippians 2, verse 5, 5 through about 8. So let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being equal with God, thought it not right to be called like God and made no reputation of himself and took on a form of a servant. In other words, remember, I said this once before, I'll, I'll repeat it. God doesn't want you bringing attention to yourself. He wants you to be able as much as possible to bring attention to the one that makes you good, God. Hello. And so Jesus, even Jesus, when the rich man came to him, he said, good master, what must I do to be saved? What did Jesus say? What did he say? No, he said, there's only one good. That's God. He didn't want any attention. Do you see? No attention to himself. Even though he was God, in the form of a man, left his Godhood here, came as anointed man, so he could die for our sin, he still didn't draw attention to himself, did he? It wasn't until the very end of his life that he called himself the son of God. It was always the son of man. You see, so when we run around bragging and telling everybody what we're doing for God, we set ourselves up. Now, we don't mean anything by that. Look at your neighbor and say, don't set yourself up. <laughs> and I used to do that all the time. I'd get up and start telling everybody what Jesus, and then I'd embellish a little bit, add to it. And pretty soon it was me because I had special favor with God. Yeah, you know what happens when that happens? If you don't humble yourself, God will humble you. Embarrassment. Embarrassment. All right, let's go back onto this. Are you getting something out of that? Yes. <laughs> All right. Have you got something to tell me? No. That's wonderful. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, listen. It says, for... Even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Jesus took our sin, right? Took our, our, our guilt and our shame. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. That's the Old Testament. Remember, they're looking towards Christ. That we, through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures. When you read the scriptures, do you get pa uh, patience and comfort out of them? Hello? You should. Because if God lives in your spirit and the word is God, then when the word God comes down and massages your spirit, comes all the way up to the eyes of your understanding, and suddenly the fruit of the spirit expands into your life, and suddenly it was like taking medicine. Or if, if you're having sugar, you need some sugar adjustment, it's like eating a little food. It makes the adjustment. A little word will do you. Amen. Get some wordies. The breakfast of champions. All right. So let's go on. Then it goes in verse 4. For whatever things written before were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded. Jews, Gentiles, be like-minded. How many know that we need to be unified too? Jesus said what? A house divided cannot stand. Okay? So they were blaming Jesus to be casting out devils with devils. And Jesus says, hey, if the devil cast himself out, his kingdom won't stand. If I cast devils, which you say I do, then how can my house stand? No, we're united. You be united. Don't let the enemy come in and tear up your family or make you indifferent towards people. Unity is power. I compromise. We all have differences in some of our faith, but we don't have a difference in loving Jesus. Can you say amen? And we can unify around him. So if you're a Jew... You can fellowship with Gentiles. If you're Gentile, you can fellowship with Jews. That's what this chapter is about. 
It goes on further to say this, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Doesn't matter your background. Have you ever heard me say, I don't care where you've been. I don't want to know your past. I care that you make it to heaven. Let's deal with today being the first day. Let's stop trying to live our life from the rear view mirror. You know, can you imagine trying to drive, looking through the rear view mirror? Not good. And that's what people are always bringing up their past. Fluffies getting brought up all the time, talking about the problems. All right, let's move right on. So a couple of points. Number one, those who are strong should be able with patience to love those that have infirmities. Did you notice our church has a lot? And, we're, and it seems like God, that seems to be one of our anointings. Just seems to be a good place for people to get healed here. And I just think it's wonderful. Amen. Amen. And loving one another. The atmosphere, you see. Point two, they were to take what was written in Scripture, okay, and the Scripture that they had, the scrolls that they had, to give them hope and comfort. Why, why does it say that? Well, because they weren't getting hope and comfort in the world, were they? <laughs> Go back six months around here. If you were looking at the world and, the, and all the news and everything, you wouldn't be getting no open comfort either. <laughs> but we seek the scripture. We seek the presence of God. Not only that, but you know, as Pastor Carrie, little old Pastor Carrie, I seek being around by brothers and sisters. It's fun being around you. You love the same God I do. Could you imagine having a church full of indifferent people? That, that can't get along and say, let us all read from the scripture and sing a song <laughs> before you hit one another. Okay, so let's go on. Point three, they were to become like-minded. And that's, remember, we Romans 7, the Jewish thought. Romans 8, Paul's now free, being born again. Freedom in Christ Jesus, right? Now they were to become like-minded. They were neither Jew nor Gentile, but we are made to focus on Jesus Christ. Also, the scripture says in, Thessal uh, in Thessalonians and several other places, don't cause divisions. Don't bring up arguments. And also said, I think it's in Romans 16, which is next week, mark those that cause division among, the, among you and don't have any fellowship with them. Well, that's pretty tough. All right, point four. I would rather learn from what is written than to experience it firsthand. Look at all the things that the Israelites went through. I don't know about you, but man, watching 12,000 people get sucked under. Yeah, you get a chance now. You have to do this in the mindset of the Old Testament. But if you read 1 Corinthians chapter, um, I believe it's chapter 10, where it talks about how that the Israelites left Egypt and they were baptized unto Moses and unto the sea. And they followed the rock. The rock that followed them was the rock of Christ. And, but it says with many of them, God was not well pleased. Get a chance, read it. Because that's there for us to learn not to do some things like complain, like uh, come against people. Here's one that's secret people don't even realize. And because it's a short lesson tonight, I can share a little bit on that. The word usurp. Everyone say usurp. Usurping authority means that you overstep the step of authority. For example, in the Old Testament, there was a woman called Jezebel. She was married to who was the king's name? Ahab. And Ahab was a, he was a henpecked dude. Okay. And Jezebel read that ran the kingdom, but through the puppet Ahab. And of course came 
face to face with Elijah and there was a big thing and prophets of Baal got all together and Elijah called on fire and we know what happened. And all the prophets of Baal, over 500, were murdered and killed for the glory of God. And then the next day, Jezebel says, by tomorrow you're going to die, Elijah. He freaks out and goes, hides in a cave. But what she gets blamed for in the Old Testament as a Jezebel spirit is really an usurping spirit. That would be like somebody came into your house and then took over. Didn't ask you permission. Now is in your closet, sleeping in your bed. God forbid. You know, just usurped every position of authority. When a person comes in, and decides to take charge without permission, that's called usurping. It's pretty dangerous. So what if somebody came into a church and they, had, they were more gifted, they sang better, and they did just about everything better than all the other people that have been in that church for months? Would it be right for them to just take over things? That would be called what? Usurping. Usurping. And so any wise pastor or wise leader would say, no, you need to sit and learn to love with the people, learn to be loved on, and learn to be humble. Then let God put you in positions of authority. Don't push your way up. And so we see in the world, there's a lot of usurping. If you're not careful in the working areas, people stepping on one another to their next position and their next raise. And all kinds of cutthroatism and all that kind of stuff. Well, that shouldn't be once named among us. Can you say amen? So I'd rather learn from what other people did in usurping and all their mistakes rather than experiencing firsthand. Can you say amen? Because once we read what God's desire is for you and I, then if we are willing, the Holy Spirit will then take that truth and walk us into it and show us all about the truth. For example, if you're, you're praying, God, teach me about love. And then I ask you to begin to educate me so I know love so well. Then the Holy Spirit takes us and moves us into places where we can begin to apply the word and apply the love of Christ. Hello. And some of them might not always be the best. What do you mean? Well, God teach me how to love. Okay, today's lesson is how to love somebody that hates your guts. <laughs> it's a joke for you. But anyway, Jesus said to do what? Turn the other? All right, let's move on. Okay, no divisions, but we're to give glory to who? God. So we're not going to agree on everything. I don't even expect for you to agree on everything. Just make sure you're saved, born again. You love Jesus. Your focus is on God. Don't try to hurt anybody and try your best to follow what God asks you to do. We could have wonderful fellowship. Can you say amen? amen? So, no divisions. Romans chapter 15, verse 7 through 13. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us. Aren't you glad he received us? Amen. To the glory of God. Verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promise made to the fathers, and that the Gentiles might, might glorify God to confirm, uh, for his mercy as it is written, for this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. So here we go. He says, God's always purposed to save the Gentiles. Now, why was the Jews, how did, why, why did God set aside a Jewish nation? Tell me. To bring forth the Messiah. Forth the Messiah. And who was the Messiah? Jesus. And he came through the bloodline. You see him, and if you read Matthew, and then you read Luke, one goes from the beginning on up, and the other one goes from the, the, the ending all the way down to the beginning, and you see the bloodlines, and it all comes together. The question was, and I hope maybe he's watching, and that is, why does God pick on all the guys and seem to leave the women out? Because he's following the bloodline. And if you know about husband, wife, you know, 
mom and dad, the man carries the bloodline while the woman feeds the child. Can you say amen? Even in the uniting, there's, there's a mix, but the man carries the bloodline. That's why Mary, the mother or the stepmother of Jesus, the earthly mother of Jesus, had to be a virgin because the blood had to be from heaven and not from a fallen man affected by Adam's sin. Amen? I hope I didn't say that wrong. I hope it said it right. I don't want to go off the trail either, all right? You with me? All right. So he says in verse 10, and again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, verse 11, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles. Loud him, or praise him, all ye peoples. Verse 12, and again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall raise to the reign, uh, he shall be raised to reign over the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles shall hope. And then verse 13, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I got a cough here, hold on. <clears throat> what was going on, Pastor Curry? Well, the Jews were doing what they were always doing. They were making everybody try to be a Jew. So here in this church in Rome, where Paul has never been, they don't have a pastor. They're still trying to convert Christians, even while they got converted to Christ, to convert back to some of the old ways. If you don't believe me, that was a problem. Read the book of Galatians. It's all about how they left Christ and went back to the practice of the law. And they left grace and fell from grace and came under the bondage of law. The book of Colossians tells us that they came under the beggarly elements of don't touch, watch out, be careful, instead of the freedom of following God like a child. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You letting Jesus have full control of your life. He'll take your wanting away and supply all of your need. That is if you don't complain too much. Moving right along, okay? <laughs> so let's go on. Let's look at a couple points. First, point one. Jesus Christ bridged the gap between the Jew and the Gentile. Amen? We are all one. Now, let's glorify God. Anybody brings up facts, that, oh, I belong to the church up the street and the church down the street. Oh, you know, everything's great. People figure out you're Christian, your fellowship is just fine until you tell them where you go to church or, or something that makes it an indifference. Remember, do your best to don't let anything make you indifferent from winning people to the Lord. Can you say amen? Don't walk around causing division. What I mean by causing people to comment, causing people to do things, and, you know, pick and fights and that kind of stuff. Because God doesn't want us antagonistic. Can you say amen? And I want to tell you, Denise, you're the most antagonistic person I know. She's not. <laughs> you know, she's laughing. Oh, thank God. No, you know what I mean? But, you know, when somebody is antagonistic, you know, it's hard to look at them as being spiritual. Because they always got a little chip going on their shoulder and stuff. But let's go on past that. Second point I want to give to you is Abraham was a Gentile 25 years before he came, became a Jew. So guess what? There wasn't any Jews when God called Abraham. He made Jewish nation out of Abraham. Remember what he said? I'm going to make you a father of many nations, plural. First one's going to be Israel, and then other nations are going to come forth from you. Why? What's going to come out of his loins all the way through the bloodline? Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But Abraham received the promise 25 years, and then it was 25 years after the promise that he was circumcised, which officially made him the first Jew. Hello? But he did it in faith. 
And it was the ones that followed afterwards started serving God by the law after Moses received the law. And I'm convinced, you might laugh at this, in Exodus 19, read it sometime maybe tonight, you'll find out that when Moses was ready to go up and receive the instructions from God, I believe, this is my conviction, that Moses was going up there to get the instructions how to get across the wilderness into the promised land, nickelly split, ready to go, let's do it for God, right? But the Israelites came to him, and they had a bad attitude. It was the attitude, oh, you tell God we be chosen, and whatever he asks us to do, we can do it. And actually, the Hebrew lets on. That they came in a prideful way and they said, God, you tell us to do it and we could do it and then some. So what, what is God not like? Pride. What does the scripture say? God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. What was Satan's downfall? Pride. Can you say amen? The moment, guaranteed as a Christian, the moment we get puffed up in pride, the moment all stuff falls apart. It's just like, boom, you drop the cup, you knock down this, you start tripping, you start bumbling around, you're going, what's wrong? Stop everything and say, Lord, have I been taking a little of the glory here? Get all, everything under and under the blood and being humble, watch everything turn right around almost instantly. Now, if you've never experienced that, take it from somebody that has experienced that. Because I used to be one on redoed when I was younger. I needed a lot of turning around. <laughs> Moving right along. Okay, third thing I want to give you is the Jewish nation was set apart for the birth of the Messiah. God's plan is that none should perish, but all would come to the knowledge of the truth. Say amen, everyone. And finally, point four. Remember, the enemy divides but God unites in love. So you immediately feel in, uh, indifference or division, shut down and don't feed that. If you think somebody's mad at you, certainly don't verbalize it. Are you mad at me? No, but I'm going to get mad at you. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, let's go down to verse 14. <laughs> Paul is... <laughs> Paul's appeal to receive his ministry to the Gentiles. Now, he was Jew, remember? He was on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. He's breathing out threatenings, getting letters to persecute Christians, and probably is involved in the murder of some. Hello. I just kind of leave that up in the air. Stephen, or Stephen, right? He was stoned to death. Then in his... Uh, his garments were laid at the feet of Paul. So Paul was a real honored dude. But one thing God saw in Paul, and that's why we don't judge and God's the judge. God saw that in Paul's heart, Paul's heart was fixed to God. He actually thought he was doing God's will. What does the law say? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. These Christians are causing people to leave. So they must be killed. Eye for an eye. But see, God, through all of that junk, saw Paul's heart. Isn't that great that, that we can make some mistakes, but God still sees our heart? And, of course, we know the story. Light shone, power of God hit him, and he fell off his high horse. Usually that's what happens to everybody when they get full of themselves. They fall off their high horse. Hello. So if you don't want to get on a high horse and get full of yourself, don't. Avoid that at all costs. Can you say amen? All right, let's go on. It says, now, he says in verse 14, Now, myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to, to admonish one another. Look, you don't even have a pastor, you here at Rome, but you have enough goodness filled with enough knowledge that you can admonish one another, stay hooked to God, right? Verse 15, nevertheless, brethren, I have written more 
boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Remember, he's talking to Jewish believers too. He's writing a letter to all of them. Ministering the gospel of God that it, the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. If God accepts them, then us Jewish people need to accept them too. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. Verse 18, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and in deed to make the Gentiles obedient. Verse 19, in mighty signs and wonders. Did Paul have mighty signs and wonders? Yeah, even the napkins or the off of his body healed people. It was the anointing of God. Of course, that's another sermon, okay? But we know, okay, we're going to read a scripture here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 through 3 later on. They'll say that I, I don't come in excellency of words, but in demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen? Our faith should stand in the power of God. So when you hear me preach or teach or someone like me or another preacher, teacher, it's the God inside them, not them. Okay? The God inside them. Like you've heard me say, it's the office and the man in the office or the office or the person in the office. Don't attack the person in the office because you have to go through the door of the office first. And the office belongs to God, but the person in the office could either be doing it in the flesh or doing it in the spirit. So guess what? Each person shall give an account of their own responsibility. So as a pastor, guess what? I have a heavier responsibility on what I do and don't do as a pastor. Right? Because I'm influencing people. All right, let's move past that, okay? All right, so he goes on. And he says in verse 20, And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named in, Jer in Jerusalem and all through that region, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom it was not announced, that they shall see, those who have not heard shall understand. Didn't he say in Romans chapter 10, how can they hear without a preacher? And so God sends ministers out. And he was picked to be a apostle to the Gentiles. Have you read actually some of the things that Paul said about himself? He said, I am the least of all apostles. And then he said something like this. He said, though God chose me out of due season, to complete the gospel. What are you going to do with that one? What did Paul do? He completed the parts of the gospel that weren't addressed to the body. They called the mysteries of Paul's teachings. Did you know that Jesus taught about them but did not address certain teachings personally? How about his rapture? When we're all going to be caught up to meet him in the air. That's not the second coming. That's the rapture. Did you know that's a Paul teaching? That God gave that revelation to Paul? It was not revealed in the Old Testament. Nor revealed in the Gospels. But God gave it to Paul. One of the other teachings. He said that God would come live in you Denise. That Christ would be in you the hope of glory. That was a teaching that Jesus talked about, but Paul addressed personally and even tells you how to do it. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. So there are teachings that Paul, as he was chosen by God to bring into the body of Christ that the body didn't have. The revelation teachings, the teachings of, of Christ when he comes, how the enemy will drop out of the air and down to the ground. Woe be to all the earth. On that day, he taught about things that were hidden, but revealed. And, and, when he, and when he talks, he says that God would give to me a revelation of the mystery to preach Christ to the Gentiles. Wow. 
What a responsibility. Now, he also said, and I'm almost finished with you. He said, because of that great assignment, because I had such a big assignment from God, Satan immediately came at me. Now, the lesson we can learn is, the more importance a person has in a servanthood of God, the more the enemy wants to take them out. For example, there are generals in God's army. There are colonels. There are lieutenants and all this, all the way down, each with their own responsibility. If you want to learn about that, read when Moses was called together by Jethro and told to pick somebody to rule over thousands, somebody to rule over hundreds, somebody to rule over tens, and, and he said everybody has a position. So depending on the person ministering, whether it be you and your position, whether it be someone else in their position, how responsible it is, is how the enemy is going to come at you. So we better be trained. Can you say amen? And so Paul, we find out. He says over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11, chapter 11, the end of that and into chapter 12, because of the multitude of revelations given to me, Satan was assigned to me to buffet me, to deal me blows, hoping that I'm going to give up. Okay. So anyway, read it on your own. We don't have time to cover all that. So here's a couple of things. Number one, those that have not heard need to hear, right? How beautiful are the feet of those to preach the gospel. Point one, Paul wanted his Jewish brothers to know his call to the Gentiles was truly of God. Two, Paul preached with power and conviction everywhere he went to bring people to Christ. God knows no difference between a Jew nor a Gentile. All men must be saved, right? Romans chapter 3. And then the third point, now he was going to Jerusalem to present the gospel and to bring a gift of finances to the church there before he went to Rome. Listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 through 4 says, and we're almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through Six, and I, brethren, when I came to you, Paul is talking, I did not come to you with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in what? The power of God. All right, finishing up, Romans 15, 22 through 33. Paul plans to come to them, okay? For this reason, he says in verse 22, I also have been much hindered from coming to you, but now no longer have I a place in these parts. He was ministering, there was the enemy, there was all kinds of hassles. It was keeping him there, keeping him from coming to Rome and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Verse 24, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way here to you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while, but now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Verse 26, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Archaea to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints <clears throat> who are in Jerusalem. Verse 27, I've got to take a sip here. Verse 27, and it pleased then, indeed, that they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things. So here's the Gentiles helping the Jewish church. Isn't that cool? You see that? They're helping the Jewish church right there in Jerusalem. And their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by the way to, uh, of you to, Spain, uh, 
to Spain. And, but, and then it says, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of Christ. In other words, I'm going to come in power. Verse 30, now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ, that through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers. Pray for me, it says, to God. He says that I may be delivered from those in Judea. Remember, they hated his guts. They were going to kill him. Who do not believe and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Now the God of peace be with you all. And everyone say, <clears throat> you say amen while I'm coughing. Sorry. But one, two, and three. Paul was held up because of the obligation to go to Jerusalem. You know, he loved people to give the church there, the Jewish church there, a gift, a financial offering. Gentiles given to the Jewish people. Wow, that's cool. And two, Paul wants to enjoy their company when it comes to Rome, right? I don't want to buzz in and buzz out. Guys, let's just hang out together. That's what we do here. And it's very important because... It shows that there's a society, if we could say a community of people that love one another. <clears throat> Amen? And that's what he wanted to do, hang out with them. And then thirdly, maybe we don't realize the power of prayer for each other. I covet your prayers to pray for me, and I pray for you. My wife and I pray for you twice daily. We actually go through names and we lift you up then if we hear there's a special need we start praying for that and that's kind of like bearing one another's burdens until actually we might be able to physically help well tonight if you got something out of that will you give god some praise